voice to worship you, oh my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear me be a sweet, sweet sound. In your ear, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King. In what you hear may be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Hi, I'm Pastor Dave, and welcome to Church Chateau to the Seas. I'm glad to have you with us today. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this message. We thank you for the book of Jonah. We just ask that you would just join us now, Lord, and that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit, Lord. May you fill us, may you lead us, may you guide us, and Lord, may we just apply what we learned today in our own lives. Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Okay, if you remember, we are racing through the book of Jonah. Ha, ha, ha. It's just four chapters long, four short chapters long, but it is a powerful book. And we can glean a lot from it. And uh, last week's lesson was on chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And we looked at the call of Jonah. And Jonah was called, if you remember, to go preach to his enemies, the Ninevites. But Jonah flees instead in disobedience to God. But some of the lessons that we learned were from last week's lesson was that we need to be careful for what we ask for in prayer. Sin comes with a cost. We learned that the devil is only too happy to assist us in disobeying God. And we are to go and share the good news with others. If we have freely received the good news, we need to go freely give it. We have no excuse because God can use anybody. It does not matter what our social status is, who our parents are or were, or where we live, or what our job is. We are to share the good news. Now, last week we saw how Jonah fled to Joppa to catch a ship for Tarshish. And while boarding that ship, we learned that Jonah had to pay a fare to board the ship. Jonah's sin was costing him financially. But then I also realized while working on this lesson, excuse me, that Jonah's sin also caused him time and trouble. Time and trouble. You see, Joppa was 60 miles away from Gath Heifer, where Jonah lived. 60 miles away. And so, it makes me ask, well, how long did it take uh, that journey for Jonah to go the 60 miles? Travel in those days was not easy. There was no car or airplane or train or bus or anything like that uh, to take. You had to either go by foot or, you know, be with an animal or riding on something. But my guess is, is that Jonah had to go on foot. He went on foot and because once he got to Joppa to catch that ship, what was he going to do with the animal? He would have had to leave it behind. 
And in those days, I do not believe there was valet parking for your camel or your donkey. So it would have been a good three-day journey, at least, for Jonah to get to Joppa on foot. But I guess Jonah just did not care. I mean, before he left his house, he knew he was going to be traveling three or more days on foot to get to that port that he was heading for. But he just did not care. All he cared about was trying to get away from what God was asking him to do. He was determined to get out of what God had asked him to do. Which tells me that Jonah, son of Amittai, was a probably a very strong-willed child. I can't imagine the problems his parents had raising him. But I also wonder, during that three-day journey, did God put up roadblocks along the way to Joppa for Jonah? Did God continue to speak to Jonah during his time of travel? Was he stirring Jonah's heart? Was he tugging on those heartstrings, telling Jonah, turn back, do what I ask of you? I can't help but believe that, yeah, God probably did. We just don't see it in the scriptures. But I know when I'm willfully disobeying God, I can feel him. I can feel that Holy Spirit convicting me. And that's a good thing. And I pray that's true for all of us, that God does send his Holy Spirit to convict us when we are sinning, or, and especially willfully sinning. But also, while traveling this great distance, think about this. Jonah could have fallen into the hands of thieves or thugs, but he didn't. Which means God showed Jonah grace by giving him travel mercies. I also wonder, was God just giving Jonah enough rope for him to hang himself later on, which is probably what it was. Now, we, as we learned last week, the book of Jonah is a small book with big things that happen. Last week, there was the big call from God and the big rebellion. There was a big call and a big rebellion, and this week we will continue to learn about Jonah's big rebellion. And we will learn today about a big storm, a big storm. So for today's lesson, we will look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. So that's Jonah chapter 1, verse 4, but we will start with verse 1 for context and as a review. So Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Here it is, verse 4, but... The Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Jonah is running away, and as we all know, he is on a ship, as we just read, on a ship to Tarshish, which is modern-day Spain. And Jonah's line of thought was, if I can just get far enough away from God then God will just have to leave me alone. If I could just get far enough away, if I could just go to the Gentiles in Spain and Tarshish, God won't be there, I don't think, and he'll just have to leave me alone. But that's just not the case with God. Because look what we see in verse 4. It starts off with the word, but. But. This word but here introduces us to God's intercession and how he began to move in a mighty way. God was not going to give up on Jonah. Jonah thinks he can get away from God, but 
as we will see and Jonah will learn is that God pursues us. God pursues us. Now think about this. In the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve sinned, after they took of the forbidden fruit, who came looking for them? Who pursued them? Well, it was God. Let's take a look at that. Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, starting in verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, as God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And here it is, verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Verse 8 and 9 shows God came looking for them. God already knew what happened, and he knew where they were hiding. But God came. He came to pursue them, to make things right between him and them. And in Luke chapter 15, verse 1 through 7, Jesus gives a parable of the lost sheep. Then all the tax collectors and all the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And what did God do? He sent his only begotten Son to pursue us, to suffer and die for us so that we can have the forgiveness of our sins and have eternal life. And in Jeremiah, it tells us that God has loved us with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. With loving kindness, he draws us to himself. Back to verse 4. Jonah was fleeing, and God was taking it personally. And you all might be asking, well, wait a minute, you know, how, how was God taking this personally? I don't see that here. Well, that's a good question, and I'm going to give you the answer. Because it says here in verse 4 that God sent out a great wind on the sea. A great wind on the sea. And right about now you might be thinking, I still don't get it. Say, well, just bear with me. Because you see, the word for wind that is used here 
When we read it in the Hebrew, or I should say the Hebrew word for wind here is ruach, ruach. And ruach can also be translated as breath and spirit. But here in this verse, ruach is translated as wind. So check this out now in Exodus chapter 15, verse 8. When Moses is, this is where Moses is praising God for their deliverance from the Egyptians after they crossed through the Red Sea. And look what it says here. And I'll start in verse 6. So again, this is Moses. He's praising God for what God had just done. And it says, Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And here it is, verse 8. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. Did you catch that? <laughs> Where it says, the blast of your nostrils, the blast of God's nostrils is speaking of a strong breath. And the same word, ruach, is used here for breath. Scripture tells us that the Red Sea was parted by God personally by a strong blast of his breath through his nose. And so it is clear to me here from the book of Jonah where it says that God sent this great wind on the sea. It was God adding his personal touch. He brought forth this storm by his own personal breath. Now this calling for Jonah to go preach to the Ninevites was a personal invitation from God to Jonah. When Jonah fled from God, God then took it personally. And now God personally brought forth this storm, adding his own personal touch. God is gracious. He is kind. He is long-suffering. And because of that, he brought a storm. And when we stray from God, be sure God will bring storms and situations into our lives to get our attention. God will bring storms and situations that are just completely out of our control to get our attention. And for those of us who've been walking with the Lord for many years, we know that to be true, don't we? Amen. And he, God does it because he is a personal God. He is personal. And he wants a personal relationship with us. And when it's been separated, he wants it restored. So how do we then respond to the storms when they come? For me, what I learned today from our, this lesson is that when this type of storm comes, it is here because God is a personal God and he loves me. That he is pursuing after me. He wants me to turn back to him to be restored back into fellowship with him. I learned a little more today about how personal God is and what personal touches he puts into his actions on getting my attention. And he'll do it for you too. Are you in a storm today? And is this storm being brought on because of your disobedience to God? I can't answer that, only you can. But is the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart today? Is he stirring you? Is he telling you, God wants you to come back? He wants that relationship restored. He's revealing sin to you, unrepented sin that you need to repent of.
Is God bringing a storm into your life because of it? Answer the call. Turn away from what you're doing and turn back to him. He's only too willing to forgive you and to forgive us. And if you have not ever received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of sins in the first place, remember, God sent his only begotten son into this world to pursue you because he loves you. He died for you so that you could have everlasting life, so that you can have your sins forgiven. So this day, if you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, all you got to do is ask. Tell Jesus Christ that you're sorry for your sins. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to become the Lord of your life. Ask him to come into your life, into your heart, and start walking with him daily. Start talking with him through prayer. Start seeking him through his word. And if you have any questions on that, you can reach out to us at churchchateau.com and email us. And I'd be more happy to help you get started in your walk with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this message today. And again, I thank you for the book of Jonah and how it just ministers to, to me. And I pray that it ministers to those who are listening. Lord, we just lift up this week to you, and we just ask your blessing to be upon it. And dear God, if we are fleeing from you, may you continue to pursue after us, draw us back to you, Lord, so that we can be like that one lost sheep that is, people are rejoicing over because we've been brought back, we've been found. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's children said, Amen.